Welcome everyone to the HLS 200 Bicentennial Summit with a focus on uh, this uh, few days, HLS in the world, and welcome also all of you who are here for your reunions, okay, and I'll come back to that. This is going to be a, uh, an interesting session. Last night, if any of you were at the opening long ceremony in Sanders Theater, any? Hands up, yeah, okay. So you know that the focus of that was HLS in the world uh, as expressed through the thoughts of six Supreme Court justices and quite naturally, they talked about the relevance of their HLS experience to their role as judges and in some cases their role as government lawyers and then the video clips stressed the role of HLS in furthering the work of people who are in public interest as well as criminal defense work with a little bit of reference to the corporate world. Okay, no, that was good, right? Uh, and, but you know what? There's this world of for-profit business out there, and um, it actually produces most of the goods and ser the majority of the goods and services that contribute to human welfare, uh, and also a lot of the funding uh, directly or indirectly for the government's good efforts to uh, produce public goods and redistribute in a wealth increasing way, in a welfare increasing way. So, you know, we've got to look at the role of HLS in the business world. And we could just say, well, okay, Professor, focus on large law firms that keep businesses, corporations on the straight and narrow. I suppose somebody else is doing that. This is going to be about <laughs> CEOs who went to Harvard Law School and other lawyer CEOs. Well, you say, well, why? All right, three prefatory remarks, real quick, I hope. One, an anecdote in uh, some statistics, and second, about uh, some ideas about why I found what I did, and third, I'll introduce briefly our, speak, our panelists. When I became dean, I was, uh, you know, some of you know, I've, I've been here almost 40 years on the faculty. And for 14 of them, I was a dean. And uh, early on in that experience, one of the first meetings I had was with a CEO, Finn Casperson. Uh, one of the second meetings I had was with another CEO named Bruce Wasserstein. <laughs> I spent a lot of time with those guys <laughs> over the 14 years and got them to make various contributions to the law school and uh, also uh, got them to make the main commitments for the creation of this building. Uh, during the quiet phase of the campaign that uh, my successor, Dean, uh, finished so uh, brilliantly, uh, Alina Kagan. So I was kind of struck by this phenomenon as my development dean said, here, let's go meet some lawyers at law firms and some managing partners, but let's also go meet these other guys and gals who were CEOs. And I, it sort of took me aback. What, what does that have to do with being a lawyer? I said, you know, corporations can hire law firms, have in-house counsel. Why, why? It seemed like there were so many of them, very surprisingly large number. Now, at least after uh, a few months, I told my development dean, uh, is this just an optical illusion, or is it just because you want me to see all the guys and gals have the most money? They have more money than, than you know. and he said, well, let me do some research. A couple weeks later, he comes back. We looked at the f backgrounds of the Fortune 500 CEOs currently. Guess what? More of them went to Harvard Law School than went to any single business school in the United States or elsewhere other than Harvard Business School and one other I will not mention. <laughs> it's not down in New Haven. Yeah. Um, and many more went to Harvard Law School than went to any other law school anywhere. So, isn't that amazing, Bob? Okay, that was a little bragging factoid that I could use when we were talking to uh, admitted students or applicant students or you know alums at reunions and so forth. Uh, but I, and it may not be precisely true today, and it might be different for mid-cap, small-cap companies, et cetera, et cetera. But in my experience, I'm fairly clear, and I've seen other surveys that it's a surprisingly large number of CEOs have legal training, and a surprisingly large number went to Harvard Law School. That's, that's the, the setup. Second, well, why? You can think about 
different explanations. I'll go from the positive. Um, well, let's start with the agnostic. You could say, no, no, no. It's just a random selection thing, as the, my uh, wonky empirical colleagues would say. That is, uh, you know, very bright, ambitious, driven people uh, go to law school as well as other schools. And uh, some of them discover at the end that they, they actually like business better than law practice. And that's all it is, you know. It has nothing to do with the legal education. It's just, you know, us, some of them like business and uh, they're ambitious and they are selected. And at some point they realize they want to do that. So it's, you know, neither here nor there. It's agnostic. Second storyline is, I like better, uh, more positive. It's something about legal education. And if you think about what the justices said last night, what was their HLS experience? That What did it do for them as judges? They had two main positive themes. One was, well, the analytical training. Lawyers learn to think very precisely about pros and cons and operational details and get into the concrete pros and cons, not just generalizations. You're really trained to do that, and that helps you in business, as well as other things. That's a nice theory. Then an alternative theory, which is not exclusive, uh, mutually exclusive, is, well, no, no, it's not just that, or it's maybe more specific, concrete legal knowledge about a regulatory system and all of its complexity and how it could affect the business. That's important. So that's, those are two positive stories that you can take from what the justices said and say, apply it to the business rule. And then, if you're really, you know, this is an institution of objective learning and research, we could have a negative story, right? Yeah, there's a lot of lawyers who run businesses, but it's terrible. It, it actually hurts uh, innovation and risk taking and, uh, you know, entrepreneurship because lawyers are so worry warded. They're worry warts. They worry about everything. They're cautious. They're sort of like religious people. You know, they don't commit crimes, but they don't take enough risks. And so it's terrible for business world. So those are three uh, scenarios. Now, to help us figure this out, I have four wonderful panelists. This gentleman is from the class of 62? Yes. Cornelius Pryor. <coughs> uh, I'm not going to say too, he'll explain his career and background, what he thinks of all this. Uh, I, I just want to say two things about him. He's headed a, a big international telecom business, and he's located in uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. So the hurricane season kind of wiped him out. I remember visiting there, the beautiful place on top of a mountain, and uh, his wife Trudy's uh, aquarium and all that. So that he's here is a great testimony to either his desire to help Harvard or to get out of the bird. It's, it's a relief to be here. <laughs> He's all, the other shout out is uh, he made a very big contribution to the law school in the honor of some guy named Dean Clark. Yeah, okay. Hmm. <laughs> uh, right? So, um, now this next gentleman is from the class of 72, which is the best class ever at all. <laughs> <laughs> Kenneth Wallach, and goes by Ken. He's a classmate of mine, no, obviously I'm biased. Um, and he's the CEO, he's been the CEO of something called Central National Goddessman. You got it. Which is a big company, but you never heard of it. And he's going to tell us what that is, what does it do, and what does uh, legal training have to do with that, if anything. Uh, it has something to do with paper, maybe? You'll find out. You'll find out. Okay, let's keep <coughs> the suspense. All right. All right, my next gentleman is from the class of 78. He goes by Jim. His name is spelled K-O-C-H, but it's Cook, Jim Cook. Uh, if you're from here, you know who he is. He founded the Boston Beer Company, uh, which, among other things, makes Sam Adams beer. I think when I mentioned to my assistant, who, I, who may be here, Kathy Goldstein, 
that he was going to be on the panel. She got so excited, like nothing else mattered. <laughs> you mean the Sam Adams guy's going to be there? He went to Harvard Law School? Okay, yeah, right. Calm down, calm down. Uh, he's going to... Well, what does that have to do with legal training? And then finally, something that you might expect more, uh, we have a financial guy from the class of 91 who's the CEO of Blue Mountain Capital, yeah, which has got a lot of billions of dollars on their asset management growing fast, and it's uh, you know hedge fund, private equity stuff. He's going to tell us about his experience. So anyway, I've talked too much. Let's turn it over first. To Neil. Thank you, Bob. I thought I would try to do this in a kind of chronological way. First, I will tell you how I ended up as a CEO instead of a lawyer. Secondly, I'll tell you how, as a CEO, the law played a big part in my career. And thirdly, I'll try to sum up by saying, did it make a difference? So when I came to law school, Roscoe Pound was still walking around with a green eye shade. <laughs> Griswold <clears throat> was the dean and teaching tax at the same time. Well, not simultaneously, but you know. And uh, law school was great. I had been at a small Jesuit school in the middle of Massachusetts, and I thought Harvard was absolutely wonderful. So in addition to enrolling at the law school, I studied Portuguese at the college because you could do anything you wanted to at this great university. So, and I had always been interested in international because I had uh, gotten a Navy scholarship to go to college and that had introduced me to Brazil and Spain and all the wonders of international. And I knew that Harvard, if there was any place that was international, it was Harvard. So I had a great time here and uh, as a result of being interested in international, I ended up getting a Fulbright as I graduated from Harvard to go to the University of Sao Paulo Law School. When I got to the University of Sao Paulo Law School, because I knew how to speak Portuguese, that's probably the only reason I got the Fulbright, uh, uh, the school was on strike. So what could I do with the school I was supposed to be attending on strike? I found a Harvard Law School alumnus who was a leading lawyer at the leading law firm in Sao Paulo. So I started working as an associate in this law firm and learning law the good old fashioned way by being an associate. And when law school strike finally ended, I said, to heck with it. I'm gonna learn, I'm gonna continue being a real lawyer. And it was terrific because that's why I happened to get a job on Wall Street later because I was corresponding with all these big Wall Street law firms because this Brazilian law firm was a very prominent firm. So I got to get to Wall Street because of my Brazilian experience, which came out of Harvard. Anyway, as a litigator and international lawyer at Sullivan and Cromwell for eight years, uh, I learned a lot about the law, but I also learned that uh, it was very, very interesting to try to find the international cases, which was very difficult to do. <clears throat> the U.S. in those days was not so international as it is now. Anyway, uh, at the end of my time at SNC, I got a chance to go to Japan and be general counsel of a development bank in Tokyo. So for three years, I pursued my international love by being a lawyer for an international bank. And as the lawyer for this bank, I realized that there was another profession called investment banking and banking that was a heck of a lot easier than being a lawyer. So <laughs> at 5 o'clock, the bankers went home, and we all had to put it all together and give it to them the next morning. So I said, that's a better profession than law. I'm going to become an investment banker. I came back to New York from Japan. <clears throat> I became an investment banker. For the next 18 years, I was an investment banker. I continued, to, though, to have my legal background, and I turned out to be an expert witness in many rate cases for utilities, so I was still keeping a, an edge on the law degree and uh, remembering my legal education. Uh, one day in Hanover Square in New York City, a fellow walked into Kidder Peabody's office and said he wanted to buy the Virgin Island Telephone Company. Could I help him? This kid was uh, 25, I think, and uh, he had a signed a contract with Mr. Janine to buy the company. 
How he ever got that, I don't know, but uh, it was a secret that he never told me. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> as an investment banker, I said, I think we can help you. And uh, he had, unfortunately, not a nickel to his name, but he had a contract. <clears throat> so General Electric had just bought Kidder Peabody, so I had a few nickels. And I said, okay, I'll, you can't do this without some equity. We've got to put in some equity. So together, we put in $1 million and borrowed 85, thanks to E.F. Hutton, if any of you are old enough to remember that. <coughs> E.F. Hutton was listening, and uh, they, they, they gave us the $85 million we needed to buy the company. So two years after I got to the Virgin Islands, there was Hurricane Hugo. And Hugo blew the telephone company down, particularly in St. Croix. It was flat. I had heard that there was something called the REA, the Rural Electric Administration, and uh, I knew Wall Street had just squeezed everything they could out of Wall Street, so I went to the REA and borrowed $66 million to rebuild the telephone company. So again, knowing where things are and doing research was, was part of it. Okay, then we had a comp uh, uh, this company had blown down, no telephones. So. I knew that in the cities in the U.S., cellular service had started to become awarded on a very competitive basis by the FCC. And I said, this is a chance for us here in the Virgin Islands to go to the FCC and say, look, you're not giving any FCC, any cellular licenses to small companies, but here's a small company that just got blown down. We need this. So, with the help of a young woman who is now my wife, we got a license, the first one in the entire USA, for a rural telephone company, and we restored telephone service in a matter of six months uh, because of getting that legal jump on the rest of the world. All right, then uh, my partner and I, this fellow who had walked into my office uh, seven or eight years before, had rather big differences about how to run the company. It got to the point where finally uh, I had to say, uh, we've got to do something, and I couldn't resolve my differences with him, and so I went to the stockholders. I had learned from Louis Loss all about uh, FCC regulation. If any, a few of you I noticed remembering Louis Loss. Uh, there is an exception to the proxy rules. You don't have to go through extraordinary regulation and filing if you only approach 10 or fewer people, stockholders, to try to take over a company. So I went to a couple of institutions. I got them to vote, and I own about 30% of the company at that point still. So with a few institutions, I got control of the company. My partner said, oh, no, you can't get away with that. And so he went to the, to the district court, federal district court in St. Croix, where he was a resident, and where his, uh, uh, one of the people who worked very closely with him, shall I say, who, her brother was the district court judge. <laughs> I lost the case in St. Croix, and I would have won at the Third Circuit, but I couldn't get expedited hearing, so we split the company in two at that point. So uh, that case, though, was a very interesting case because although I lost the case, Judge Finch said that uh, I had gone to more than 10. For example, my wife had 50 shares, and he said, even though you may not have formally gone to see her, she must have heard you, and therefore she counts, and you had 13, well, I count 13 people that you would talk to. Anyway, so I lost my first big loss case, but it turned out that we then divided the company in two, and so I separated from my partner as a result of this lawsuit, and thereafter, uh, my partner eventually borrowed $600 million from the REA and various other institutions, the Rural Telephone Finance Cooperation. And uh, he went bankrupt. And fortunately, my company has continued to do well. And I have been able to support the uh, law school that founded me a long time ago. So I think <coughs> my, con and there were uh, a couple of other cases, but uh, I think that at least in the telecommunications world, law is prominent practically every day. You cannot be a good CEO of a telecommunications company unless you are aware of the law and are constantly 
keeping track of what the FCC is doing. So I don't know about the other professions, but I can tell you that from my point of view, uh, it was essential, and I never could have been successful in getting this company to be the size it is today if I hadn't had this background at the Harvard Law School, thanks to Bob and others. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. Wow. So we might generalize that to say, well, it's uh, pretty good for people who are in highly regulated industries that are international and have a lot of different jurisdictions. But, you know, maybe that's too far. So why don't we turn to Ken and tell us. Happy to. Um, I have to say that I haven't been a, uh active alum in the law school, uh, not having practiced law for nearly 40 years. So when I got the call and then I discussed this with you, um, it was quite a challenge because I hadn't really thought much about the impact of Harvard Law School in my career. But I'm happy to say the training I got allowed me to do, to do that, to think about it and analyze it. Um, <clears throat> so there's some good things and some not so good things. But first, um, I'm the executive chairman of a company called Central National Gottesman. Um, I was the CEO for 17 years and became executive chairman in 2015. Uh, the company was founded by my great-grandfather in 1886. So I was actually the fourth generation um, to lead the company. So for the younger people here who, who came here hoping to figure out how to be a businessman and a CEO, I can tell you being an owner is a big step up. <laughs> um, okay. Although I like to think that a few other things are important too. So uh, my company is a little different from the, the other panelists here because uh, we are 100% we are private, family owned. So uh, we have no public stockholders, we have no public debt, and we have no outside investors. Um, so just as you ruminate about whatever I'm about to say, the flip side of that is, of course, we have family issues to deal with, which um, are a little bit a little bit different, but uh, being private and family owned means that 100% of the CEO's time can be devoted to business, which is a little different from a public company. We don't have to make uh, presentations to security analysts, meet with investors, or uh, deal with quarterly earnings projections. So uh, we, we can plan our business for the long term, to create long term value for the shareholders, which in our case is the family. Um, uh, the, the third difference that I should mention is that we are a B2B company. Uh, we don't deal with consumers. We're a business that sells to other business businesses. Um, which is a fancy way of saying we're a wholesaler. So let me talk a little bit about my background, tell you a little bit about the business, and then talk a little bit about uh, the law school and the legal training. So I'm a product of the New York suburbs. Uh, I was exiled when I was 14 to a uh, typical New England boarding school uh, and uh, spent three years there. Went from there. Hmm? Exile. Exile, yes. It was Hotchkiss in those days. You went up okay, in September right. and they took the key to the main gate and threw it away until spring came. <laughs> um, I think it's a little different now. So I went from there to uh, Harvard College where I was an English major and went directly to the Harvard Law School, which uh, a lot of people did then. I don't think people do so often now. Um, I graduated in 1968, uh, and uh, no, I graduated from college in 68, went to law school, graduated in 72 after having taken a year off because uh, as many, if they're classmates here, many of us had to do deal with the military. This was the days of the Vietnam War. Uh, there were no more graduate deferments, and I enlisted in the uh, Army Reserves, so I did that. Uh, which, by the way, was a wonderful experience. That was those were the days uh, before a volunteer army when you had to deal with the draft. But that's for another subject. So then, then I clerked for a judge, J. Edward Lombard, in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, a very distinguished jurist. 
I learned one very important thing in clerking for a judge, and that is that I never, ever wanted to be a litigator. Um, <laughs> what he put those litigators through. Uh, and, then, and then I, too, worked in, uh, at a law firm, the Debevoise and Plimpton, uh, having left it then to join our family company, Central National Goddessman. Now, that is not a family, that is not a household uh, name for you. We are a a distributor of products that come from trees. Uh, paper, uh, a wood pulp, container board for corrugated boxes and other kinds of packaging materials, tissue, newsprint that newspapers are printed on, uh, plywood, and now we're beginning to dabble in, in, in uh, steel and aluminum a little bit. So I realize that doesn't <clears throat> mean a lot to you, uh, and just to be clear, because I sometimes get questions about whether we're raping the forest. We, we do not own trees, and we do not own paper mills. We're strictly a middleman. So we buy from the manufacturers and sell to the people who uh, use those. Uh, to give you a, a picture of the, of the business, we, we sell about $5.5 billion worth of pulp and paper products a year. Uh, we... We are the largest private distributor of paper in North America. Uh, we have 44 warehouses in, in the U.S. and Canada where we provide next day delivery to commercial printers and almost everything you deal with is produced by a commercial printer. Uh, we have 56 paper stores which are really mini warehouses for small printers and uh, end users. And then we have 26 international offices located in Europe, Latin America, and Asia. About 55% of our business is in North America, and the other 45% is uh, outside North America, global. Uh, many of you do business with us all the time, although you don't know us. Uh, the catalogs you get, the restoration hardware catalog, the Orvis catalog, the Land's End catalog, um, Williams Sonoma, Avon, Bloomingdale's. Uh, we, we buy the paper from the manufacturer and sell it to the catalogger. Uh, if you read a Vogue magazine or an L or a New York magazine, if you read a John Grisham book, uh, for those of you um, who are uh, musical, the Bruce Springsteen autobiography that made a big splash this year, uh, the uh, Harry Potter books. So we're in the middle of these transactions, and so our goal is to be in the supply chain between anybody who makes paper and anybody who uses it, and we try and do that all over the world. So, uh, getting to my career, uh, I, I left uh, the practice of law and joined the family company, and I made the decision that I did not want to do that as a lawyer. Uh, I took a, a line job uh, selling newsprint in Latin America, and at that point, Latin America was a very big market for us outside North America. And actually, I sold newsprint, believe it or not, because newsprint for newspapers was a very big uh, business for us. So you could see how business changed dramatically. Uh, now our second biggest market is China, uh, which is huge. Uh, Latin America, we still have la la offices in Latin America, but it's a small, much smaller a part of our business. Um, but uh, I would encourage any of you who are uh, younger in the audience, if you have a chance to take a sales job, and that's what I did, it is the most wonderful training for anything you do in life. Almost any career requires sales. We're all salesmen one way or another. And you learn an awful lot about yourself and about life if you, uh, have a, if you, if you take a sales job. Uh, you learn not to take yourself too seriously. Uh, you learn how to deal with people. You see that there's no one model or one form to be successful in being a salesperson. Uh, it, it, is, uh, it is a great, a great training for almost everything. Um, so we've, uh, our business, as you know, we've, we've had lots of challenges. Uh, we, we dealt with the internet, uh, rise of the internet, which now is referred to as the internet bubble in 2000. Um, our products have become commodities much more than they used to be. We've had to deal with imports. Uh, there's been tremendous consolidation in our in industry on the supply side, on the customer side. And, of course, what you're all familiar with, which is the uh, secular decline in the demand for paper. 
But interestingly, there have been uh, some trends that have been very helpful for us, which you might not think about. Uh, the world went from the world of conglomerates when I started uh, to the world of outsourcing. And if you're a service provider, as we are, outsourcing uh, is terrific. Businesses now concentrate on what they do best, and they're happy to hire people to provide services that those outsiders can do better at less cost. And that's really uh, largely what we do. I like to think we don't sell paper, we sell services. Um, 2008, the, the financial crisis was a tremendous opportunity for our business. So many of the s smaller, the medium-sized uh, merchants that we compete with here in North America were facing a declining market, uh, less and less paper being used. And it, I, I used to tell them they were sitting on depreciating assets, but nobody believed me. The financial crisis in 2008 did a better job of convincing people they did not want to be in the paper distribution business than I was ever able to do. So people felt there was a huge decline after 2008 in paper consumption, which I'm happy to say came back by 2010. Not completely, but largely. And a lot of these people were under financial pressure. So we were able to buy a lot of our competitors, which was a an enormous help in, get, in helping us grow and gain market share. And our business has grown enormously since then. Uh, the, um, I think we made, we made 16 acquisitions between 2010 and today uh, in doing that. The other thing that was very helpful for us in our business was the rise of private equity. And uh, uh, the private equity owners of businesses, and they bought businesses in our sector, uh, they, they were not interested, those buyers are not interested in owning these companies for a very long time. So the last thing they wanted to do was to build up a big infrastructure. So they could come to us and we could provide a sales function, a logistics function, a credit function, a financing function for them. We had salespeople all around the country and all around the world. They were happy to do business with us and just concentrate on making the product. So private equity turned out to be a very good thing for us. Technology turned out to be an enormous value for our business, and I think for a lot of other businesses. Um, the, it, it was really, it, it's miraculous. Just technology allowed us to become more efficient in what we do, and at the same time provide services that we couldn't dream of before, um, to our customers, and at the same time, it was horribly expensive, uh, which meant it wasn't easy for our competitors to do that. So technology turned out to be the, the gift that keeps on giving for us. So anyway, I, the, I mean, on the other side, we do have family issues that, that play a little larger role in our affairs. Uh, but back to the subject of this panel. Right. I hope I haven't run on too much about business, but I thought some of the audience right. might right. be interested in business. You're not sure. interested in business. I, oh, all right. I okay. teach a corporation. Right. Okay. <laughs> we spend several classes on the special problems of closely held family businesses, which ah. have generated so much litigation and special doctrine in multiple states. Right. I right. would think lawyers would really want to know about that, but don't, don't get into your family fights. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been blessed. So far, so good. Uh, so th as I started out by saying, I had to think a little bit about the role of law school. And, uh, and uh, you know, when I thought about it, uh, I really got the building blocks for a business career here. But they're the building blocks really for being an executive. So being, being, having a line operational job, it isn't much help to know much about uh, estate tax planning or uh, securities law. Um, but if you are a CEO, all of a sudden these, these issues become incredibly important. So business planning, which I think I heard somebody else talk about, Professor Hurwitz, it was just an invaluable, um, invaluable course. Um, I got basic accounting from Professor Vatz. Uh, Absolutely terrific. Tax with Professor Westfall, and I went, I was an early panel, or somebody was talking about Louis Loss. Yeah. I guess it was right. Neil. Yeah, right. I mean, Louis Loss was terrific. But aside from that, you learn, and I think 
others have referred to it, the ability to analyze complex situations. Uh, you, you learn the vocabulary and the concepts of, of business. Uh, analytical thinking, to try and think clearly. Uh, something that was mentioned to me last night, which was not the top of my list, which was values. When I went to law school, people talked about public service. They talked about the importance of civic responsibility. And those things, I think, run, rub off on you when you're, in, when you're in law school. So I think that's important in whatever you do. And if you're a business leader, those kinds of things actually matter. Um, and then the ability to look at all sides of an issue. Uh, you know, we all, we are, all of our instinct is to think very much about our side of an issue and what we want and how we look at it and our arguments. But if you sit through these uh, classes, uh, you've had Professor Bice uh, drilling you and drilling you in contracts. Uh, you have to look at the world. What do other people think? What, is the, what are the ar other arguments? And, uh, and that's enormously helpful in business. Um, but the other part of the equation for me in my life was uh, the practice of law. For me, the practice of law is what uh, was extremely helpful. So I was lucky. I was at an age where you could, you could practice all different kinds of law, securities, corporate, financings, proxy statements, uh, uh, takeover battles, uh, property. And, uh, and that, was, uh, that was enormously, uh, enormously valuable. And uh, you know, one of the things that practicing law teaches you uh, is negotiation. So uh, if, if you want to have a good long-term relationship with another party, you really have to try and think about what's good for them, not just what's good for you. And the aim is, and you've heard it all before, to try and find things that maximize the other party's wins and your wins. And that can create a long-term -term enduring relationship. Uh, you know, we've all heard that the best contract is one that you uh, sign and then put in your desk drawer and don't look at for 15 years. Well, that's really true. Every Every business deal that I've worked on that's worked, that's the way it has worked. Uh, there's only one area that uh, is an exception to that that I've come across in my personal life, and that's real estate. Some real estate people tend to look at the world as a zero-sum game. And I think that may go a little ways to describing our current political um, situation. <laughs> but, okay. but, but All right, on that happy note. <laughs> <laughs> All that, right. Is that enough? That's great. Great <laughs> stuff. Okay. So let's turn to Jim Cook. Thank you. Um, Do you have any beer for us? <laughs> you know, I meant to bring it because I'm really boring when I'm sober. So <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I'll try to pretend. I mean, I got something brewed, but it's not beer. So okay. unfortunately, um, so I'll try to pretend I've had a beer um, and maybe tell a little bit of my story. I. Uh, Gosh, I uh, came to Boston and Cambridge to go to college in 1967 in what were crazy times when, you know, you, if you uh, flunked out, you ended up in the infantry in Vietnam because your local draft board didn't like Harvard people. And so it was, a, and, you know, and uh, Harvard was taken over, I guess, in my four years. We only had exams two years because mm -hmm. uh, they were canceled. The other two, it was kind of a crazy time, and uh, at that time, Ralph Nader was a big role model, I think, for people as a lawyer. And uh, applications to law school were quite high; the best and the brightest were coming to law school. Um, and I had the totally mistaken notion that law school was part of uh, sort of a continuation of a humanistic liberal arts education. Uh, and then you have here. a mistaken idea about that. <laughs> Very mistaken. And I came here and I realized Amen. it's a trade school. Uh, <laughs> this is like taking shop in high school. <laughs> um, you're learning to use tools and uh, it uh, leads to very specific career outcomes. And, and I guess I had also uh, applied to the business school. So I was part of the, or one of the early classes of JD MBAs. Um, which is still a program in existence for, I don't know, a dozen people a year. And it's a kind of demanding program because you do the first year of, of one school and then the first year of another. And then you do the next three years compressed into two years. So um, anyway, I did the first two years and was somewhat shell-shocked by uh, all of this. 
Um, and so uh, actually someone in the admissions office of the law school told me a secret, which was you can drop out. And they kind of have to take you back because, uh, you know, you will have taken up a place in two first-year classes. And between the two of them, they don't take very many transfers. So as long as you don't, like, get arrested or, uh, you know, stay away too long, you can drop out and come back. And they, and they kind of have to take you back. So I did. Um, I dropped out. Um, I was gone for three and a half years. I, I spent it working as an outward bound instructor, which was in its own right a really great uh, sort of life uh, experience. And finally, I came back. Um, I did have the wonderful experience. Um, in, just as I was graduating from business school, I got a chance to go to my fifth year reunion. Um, people asked me, so what are you doing now, Jim? And they were like on their second job, and their second marriage or whatever. And it's like, well, uh, I'm graduating next week. I'm really proud of that. Um, so I, I came back and uh, uh, got way more involved, uh, actually helped start the Harvard Environmental Law Review, which is still the premier publication in its yeah. field. Um, and finally graduated, decided that I really didn't want to be a lawyer uh, and because it just, uh, and I had a choice which was unusual and so I had a terrible time getting a job at a law firm. Um, I got turned down by uh, significant law firms in most of the major cities of this country and the only job I had was uh, a sort of second tier law firm in Seattle for $18,000 a year because law firms didn't want to hire people with an MBA because you, as one of them explained to me, well, if you got an MBA, you have options. You could leave. We don't want people who have options like that. Uh, so I uh, went to Boston Consulting Group um, and kind of had an epiphany there in, she was on my first case for a company that you do a lot of business with, which was International Paper. Um, this was 1978, uh, and they were sort of going to the new CEO, and they hired us to look at uh, different aspects of their business. And at that time, they were the largest private landowner in the United States. They had uh, six million acres of timberlands, which is, that's a lot. That's like half the state of Maine, um, or half the state of Alabama. And, um, and they asked us to look at it, and so that, I, that was my case, and I looked at it, and was fascinating because they were they were mismanaging this enormous capital asset uh, and I won't go through all of it but the bottom line was they could instantly double the productivity uh, in terms of, of uh, pulp and, and saw timber out of uh, those six million acres and maintain that forever <laughs> so they could double the production and maintain it forever and when I was on the environmental law review, one of the issues back then, you know, which uh, Ken alluded to, was raping the national forests because we needed the wood. Well, um, so we did this case for the national paper. They started harvesting their lands. They changed their silvicultural practices. And today, there's no need to harvest our national forests, which are like cathedrals. They're wonderful, amazing, and they were clear cutting them. And what occurred to me is, you know, one of the things that drew me to Seattle was the firm allowed you to do pro bono stuff, and I could litigate for the NRDC and the Sierra Club to keep them from clear cutting all those beautiful forests out there. Mm -hmm. Now, I could have spent my whole life fighting, you know, the timber companies over uh, that practice, and we'd still be litigating, and they'd still be, you know, clear cutting national forests. But by going into business and finding a win-win, that issue totally went away. There was nothing I would have done in my career as a lawyer that would have produced the benefit that we were able to produce by improving the efficiency of a significant business. Nothing. So I, I mean, and I look back, that was probably of what I've done in my life, the most worthwhile thing was saving the national forests from 
needless uh, harvesting and letting them grow as beautiful, wonderful, wild places. So that was a uh, kind of enlightening thing, and it made me appreciate the the power uh, of business to make a difference, and and in a win-win way, because uh, IP uh, their profits went up 40 percent by doing this. So it was a big win for them, and it was a big win for our society uh, and our ability to preserve beautiful places. So I, I spent six years at. Boston Consulting Group and was a manufacturing consultant there helping people run their factories better and after six years I, I got to a point where you know, I wasn't uh, just doing business problems and helping people and solving things. I was, instead I was learning to be a consultant at that point and sell cases and manage cases uh, and help run the firm and administer and I had uh, I thought all right, do I want to be a consultant for the rest of my life? And I, the answer was, no, I don't. Um, and I said, okay, and the rest of my life begins tomorrow. So I went in, and I gave him my notice. Uh, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I knew that uh, I didn't want to be a consultant, and I would find something. I mean, those three and a half years at Outward Bound certainly taught me a lot of self-sufficiency, confidence, uh, you know, just don't worry. Things are going to be okay unless you make really stupid decisions and, and usually multiple of them. And so I cast about for what to do. Uh, and this was 1983-84. And the U.S. beer uh, landscape was a wasteland. Um, there was no good beer here in the United States. When people wanted a good beer, they turned to an import to German or English or Australian or Canadian beers, and everybody made fun of American beer. There was this really annoying joke about why is American beer like making love in a canoe. Um, I don't see anybody chuckling. Does somebody any, somebody answer? must know the punchline. I don't that's it, because it's fucking close to water. <laughs> <laughs> that was American beer. I, um, I once had the privilege of talking to uh, the congressional leadership of the Republican Party and got to tell that joke while I was looking in straight at Orrin Hatch, um, <laughs> who doesn't drink or swear, but he laughed. <laughs> uh, so uh, that was the simple idea of Sam Adams. Is I, My dad had been a brewmaster, and my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, and my great-great-grandfather uh, had all been brewmasters. So I knew a little bit about beer, and I knew I could make great beer here in the United States. And I could give it to people fresh. So I could put in front of an American beer drinker the best glass of beer they could get in this entire country. And I didn't know how big the market was going to be. I mean, it's a little embarrassing because I was at BCG, you know, had done reasonably well there. I was supposed to be pretty good about business and running numbers. And here I came to my own business, and my projection was that after five years, we would grow to be a little over a million dollars in revenue, and then it would level off. That would be about 5,000 barrels. And that would be an okay life. I could, wouldn't have to travel. Uh, my wife hated the travel. She was threatening to divorce me. Um, so uh, I started Boston Beer Company. And none of it turned out to be true. My wife divorced me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> she got the house and I got the beer company. So <laughs> we're still friends. <laughs> Uh, and, I, and the business way exceeded the business plan. Instead of uh, 5,000 barrels, we're now 4 million barrels. Um, and a little un instead of a million dollars, we're a little under a billion dollars. So uh, luckily, I was horribly wrong in the right direction. Um, and you know, when I look back at it and think about law school and how did it fit in, and, I, and before I even get to that, I would very much second with what Ken said about selling. Because when I started Sam Adams, I couldn't get any distributors to carry my beer. Everybody turned me down. Um, luckily in Massachusetts, the law allows you to self-distribute. So that was what I did. I put cold beer in my briefcase. I could get five bottles, two blue cold packs, and a sleeve of cups. And I went from bar to bar selling beer. 
and it was an incredibly liberating experience because you know uh, I was able to go from you know I had an office on the 33rd floor of one of the towers downtown you know I had to, uh, we traveled first class we stayed at the Ritz and places like that and in one day I rode that elevator down to the ground floor and walked out and I was a beer salesman and now uh, it, my life became human to human contact and uh, you know I had three Harvard degrees and that was always kind of this armor that was sort of protective and it gave me a sense of self and identity and even maybe of superiority and all of a sudden that didn't matter you know I was walking into bars and restaurants they didn't know who I was I was one more schmuck selling beer they don't want to see salespeople you sell beer you don't go into the front of the restaurant you go into the back you know, <laughs> nobody speaks English back there the floors are slippery back there and it smells funny but that became my world and that uh, liberated me from all of these things that keep us you know in our with our nice incomes and clothes and you know great educations and privilege you know keep us away from the rest of humanity and now I needed them you know my self-esteem was in their hands if they told me they didn't want my beer it tasted like crap and why was I doing this stupid thing and get out of my bar which occasionally happened you know that was very, uh, you know, that damaged my ego. And so all of a sudden I was very vulnerable and it was great. It was one of the great things. And, and you learn to respect selling because here at Harvard, selling is a debased skill. Um, to this day, Harvard Business School has not a single course on selling. And you just heard how important it is, and everybody in business will Absolutely tell you right. That. And Absolutely they, right. And to this day, and I've had arguments with uh, your well. fellow Dean Nitten and his predecessors, they still won't do it. To them, selling is like something, you know, for they people. Of course, with, is in marketing, but. Well, they, that's exactly <laughs> right. That's exactly. I will. I have to. I mean, here's. I was giving all a right, talk at right, Harvard right, Business it, School <laughs> about exactly this. And there was this annoying kid who kept talking about, well, selling is just another form of marketing. And marketing is what really drives products. Yeah. And that's why we learned marketing here. Well, wait, 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 wait. You brand, too. Uh, is it true, for example, that you used to uh, sample every new uh, I still type of do. I still taste a sample of every batch every batch to make sure it's good and it conforms yeah. to your great-grandfather's expectations yeah, yeah. No, as, I still as you do understand that. them. It's about 25 beers a day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I now <laughs> understand why he has the, right. the horse voice. Uh, but I, mean, I can't <laughs> leave the marketing comment because <laughs> it's, it's what make me, makes me crazy because this kid kept telling me about how selling and you can't uh, no, I, I got second, it. I, it's not it's the same as selling. just part of marketing. And then in, and he said, what's the difference between marketing and sales? And you know how we all have kind of a little devil that sits on our shoulder and it whispers things to say? And usually we don't say them because that's a good idea. But the devil whispered into my mouth and I said it. So he said, what's the difference between marketing and sales? And I said, I'll tell you what's the difference between marketing and sales. It's the difference between masturbation and sex. <laughs> One of them you can accomplish all by yourself in a dark room and think you're making a difference. The other requires all the fury and mire and muck and complexity of human to human interaction. And which do you think is more gratifying? <laughs> <laughs> so that's... <laughs> okay. So, so if you had it to do again, would you go to law school? I did. did. You know, and okay, you, you're glad. Well, you I know, just want to hear something positive. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I'll, well, I'll say two things. Um, because uh, you raised a very thoughtful question in our phone conversations. I was trying to think, I mean, I never even took the bar, 
uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I mean, I went in, I didn't pass kind of it, but uh, the, what I did get here um, is uh, a sort of very fundamental thing is the, the approach to knowledge that uh, Harvard Law School has and the case study method has and the common law itself mm. has, which is a very interesting, somewhat unique approach because it teaches you to think rigorously, very rigorously, and logically and, and analytically about a kind of knowledge which is not rigorous and fixed. It's not like Aristotelian knowledge which is, you know, necessary and universal and certain. You know, our knowledge, uh, the law and in the common law is the same in business. You know, everything is, it's, it's contextual and it's conditional and it's probabilistic. Hmm. And that fundamental approach to knowledge uh, and to figuring things out is, is fundamental to business and fundamental to creativity in business and, and entrepreneurship. We, mm -hmm. uh, everybody here is entrepreneurs who's kind of made their own way, mm -hmm. uh, brings that skill of looking at a world which is conditional and, and probabilistic and contextual. And that's how we find our solutions. That's good. So okay. I got that like the analytical from law thing. school. Right. And if, okay. one last thing which I would say to the students here, which is, and it's, it bothers me a, a bit, um, when all of us were here, roughly, I think, 85% of the graduates went into the law uh, in one way, shape, or form. And that number hasn't really changed in 40 years. However, the, uh, the rewards for the law versus the rewards for business and the things that people mm -hmm. up here do and some of, I mean, I know people in the audience who uh, went here and then went into business and had amazingly rich, interesting lives. Uh, the rewards for being a partner to law firm 40 years ago were really good. It was tenure, you made good money, you got paid equivalent to a CEO, to a Goldman partner. They were kind of equal. That's totally changed in 40 years, totally. Yet, the same percentage of people go into law. And Harvard Law School has really smart, really talented people. You're the best of the best. Yet, uh, you are making your career decisions based on something other than logic and rationality. Otherwise, that ratio would have changed. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. But I don't know. Okay. <laughs> you said you wanted a discussion. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, logic, rationality, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, why don't we turn? I got <laughs> to our final. I, got, uh, I, I drew the short open. straw. <laughs> it's it's no fair. Time. I got no canoe stories. <laughs> I no got canoe. no good metaphors for marketing versus sales. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're, you sort of fit into what I would have thought was the kind of standard model of the CEOs who went to Harvard Law School. That is, I, I was thinking, for example, there are three of them that would have been at this summit in one form or another if they weren't conflicted, uh, just to mention some of them. Uh, Roger Ferguson, the head of TIAA. Uh, Ken Chenal, who just finished 16 years as the CEO of American Express who was somebody I knew as a dean back back then. Uh, oh, and Lloyd Blankfein of Goldman Sachs. Now, what's common about all of them, as well as Wasteen Kasperson, they're heads of financial firms, and you say, well, of course. Lawyers, CEOs might make sense in that business because it's highly regulated financial, and they would have insights that people who only went to business school wouldn't have. So that, that was my framing, and so you, you fit that model, although you're much the younger generation. Tell us. Uh, well, before I start, I, I was under the impression that sitting on the panel was going to get us beer. And <laughs> if, you, if you can. So I'm a little disappointed, but I'll, I'll, if I'll give it my best. If you get there on time, we'll, we'll work on All it. All right, yeah, so okay. I'll give it. Um, so I just real quickly what I do, what, what my firm does, and then I'll take you through my history and uh, try to relate it to uh, what I learned and my experiences in law school. Uh, I founded, uh, co-founded Blue Mountain in 2003. 
Um, and uh, we started with $300 million under management, um, focused primarily on investing in credit at the time. Um, and over the last 14 years, uh, we've grown quite a bit. We now manage $25 billion, uh, give or take. Uh, we started with eight people. We now have 300. Um, and we've got uh, four offices, one in New York, one in London, one in Los Angeles, uh, and believe it or not, one in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, the, uh, the, our investment strategies uh, range from uh, very, very liquid markets, uh, trading in the, in the equity markets and the credit markets and the FX markets, uh, to very, very illiquid strategies in things like real estate and private equity. Um, and our approach to investing uh, ranges from uh, the very, very human-dominated strategies uh, where negotiation and game theory is very, very important to very machine-dominated strategies uh, where uh, people are involved in uh, buying data and writing algorithms, but then they instruct machines uh, on how to invest. Um, so we've grown over the past uh, 14 years to a fairly diversified um, and scaled uh, asset manager. The, if we wind back uh, of my history, uh, I grew up in a small town in northern Arizona called Flagstaff um, and didn't know anything about finance uh, when I grew up there. And uh, my analog to the, the sales story um, is uh, probably the most influential job I ever held or influential series of jobs I ever held. Uh, started out in middle school when I was a busboy at a restaurant. Um, and I worked at that same restaurant um, uh, all through middle school, high school, and the summers in college, and worked my way up to be a waiter, which was a great honor, uh, having started out as a busboy. And when I reflect on where the job in which I learned the most, and there's a, some selling aspects to it, um, but it was really working in a restaurant. Um, and the reason uh, I, I've decided that was the most influential job is the core skills are, number one, you do a lot of things at once. Uh, number two, you've got to do math in your head really, really quickly. And you've got to be nice to people no matter how much they piss you off. Mm. So um, it, it really was the, sort of the, the most foundational job in terms of, of developing the traits that I think I've, I've carried with me. I went to uh, Georgetown University. I graduated in 1986. I spent two years at a consulting firm here in Boston, uh, not BCG, but Bain. Um, and then I decided I wanted to go to law school. Um, and thankfully, Harvard Law School admitted me. The, I, had a wonder, I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, uh, people asked me, uh, why are you going to law school? Uh, why, uh, why aren't you staying in consulting or going into business? Um, I didn't have a very good answer other than this stuff seems really interesting to me. Um, so I would make stuff up, uh, like saying I wanted to be a constitutional lawyer. Uh, which was only, <laughs> only partially, I mean, I, what, it was one of the things that seemed interesting to me. Um, and then uh, something surprised me, which was uh, in the first semester, uh, I loved my 1L year. Yeah. Um, then the, the first semester of my 2L year, uh, I loved a course that I never thought I would, which was tax law. Um, and I had tax, tax law, tax law uh, yeah. with Louis Kaplow. Um, and it was, uh, it, it was really this amazing combination of, you know, uh, at once this profound philosophical questions about fairness and how we share the burdens of living in a society um, to really, really fun textual puzzles. I mean, you read the Internal Revenue Code and the regulations. It's right, really yeah, Let's pause on this. You yeah. actually read it. You uh, yeah, I did. I still did do. What I always <laughs> tell them to do. You've got to read the statute. I, you know, I also do a lot of crossword puzzles. Okay. So um, <laughs> I don't know whether, I mean, and I found them to be somewhat similar, and they, uh, yeah. they appealed to that same uh, uh, part of my, my personality. And the other thing was there was a lot of math. Um, which I really like. And so the combination of these three things really made me like tax, somewhat to my surprise. I had never thought I would take another tax course after taking that, but I ended up taking three more. I took uh, corporate tax, international tax. And then the, the course that, that, that um, more than any other really changed the direction of my life. Uh, in my 3L year, I took a seminar uh, with Al Warren. Uh, who at the time was interested in the taxation of uh, financial instruments, uh, also known as derivatives. 
Um, and it seemed interesting to me, and I had never heard of derivatives. Um, and uh, Professor Warren suggested to me a topic I might write my paper on, and I said, that sounds really interesting. Um, and I, he said, you better learn how these things work, though, before you write a paper. Uh, and he handed me uh, a Brilliant Myers, uh, Corporate Finance. And I read about how options work and how interest rate swaps work, and I was in heaven. Um, and the, I, I found what, what really uh, excited me and animated me. And when I uh, graduated from law school, I knew I wanted to be a tax lawyer, and I knew I wanted to work for a firm that did um, a lot of taxation of financial instruments. So I went to Sullivan and Cromwell, um, who worked very closely with Goldman Sachs, um, and this was in the uh, early 90s, and so it was a period of very rapid um, uh, development and creativity in the derivatives markets. Um, and I picked the right firm. They did a lot of work with Goldman, um, and they did a lot of work on, on these, these instruments that, that uh, uh, interested me. Um, but I found that I was spending all of my time understanding the instruments rather than doing the tax law part of it. So after about a year at Sullivan and Cromwell, I decided that um, uh, practicing law wasn't what I wanted to do. What I really wanted to do was derivatives. Um, and at the time, uh, uh, and still today, one of, the, uh, one of the biggest participants in the derivatives markets was JP Morgan. Um, so uh, through a, a friend that my wife had who had nothing to do with derivatives but worked at JP Morgan, she got me an interview. Uh, I walked into JP Morgan and convinced them they should hire me to work on their derivatives desk. And in 1992, I started working on the interest rate derivatives desk at JP Morgan. Um, and what followed was a 10-year uh, fairly successful career at Morgan, um, uh, working first in interest rate derivatives. Um, and then I had the, the good fortune uh, to join the credit derivatives desk in 1995, um, back when credit derivatives was not a bad word. Um, and so uh, JP Morgan was a pioneer in credit derivatives, and so I had the, the good fortune to do that. Um, and from there, I became much more mo involved in the credit markets generally. Um, and my success at Morgan owes a lot, I think, to um, what I learned at law school. There's certainly the, um, the, the substantive knowledge, derivatives and debt are contracts. Um, when debt goes bad, you have to uh, follow the bankruptcy code. Financial regulation was very important. Um, so a lot of the substantive knowledge was very valuable, but like everybody said, the, the, you know, learning how to think uh, was very, very important. It's a very analytical uh, uh, set of activities. Um, and I think the, the, both the substantive knowledge um, and the analytical skills that I picked up in law school, then the ability to deconstruct uh, problems um, uh, before you solve them and then reconstruct the pieces into a solution uh, was very, very valuable. Um, and so I had a, a, a successful career at Morgan, and then in 2003, uh, for a variety of reasons, I decided I would, uh, with a friend uh, who I met at Harvard Law School, um, so yet again, Harvard Law School influencing uh, the, the path uh, that I took. Uh, together, we founded Blue Mountain. Um, and uh, 13 years later, here we are. And I think about my experience um, and some of the things uh, that, that led us to succeed at Blue Mountain. Um, and, and many of them, I think, I derived from, from my time here at law school. So again, there are, there are the obvious ones, which are the substantive knowledge, which continues to be very, very important. Um, and there's the analytical thinking, which continues to be very, very important. Um, decision making um, and making good decisions. Um, you know, being in business is a series of decisions. Um, you make some good ones, you make some bad ones. Um, and if you can make just a few more good ones than you make bad ones, then you win. Um, and one of the things that Harvard Law School teaches you to do, I think, is make good decisions. Um, and it's about uh, listening to all the facts. It's about having an open mind. Uh, it's about good decision-making process. Um, so that was very important. Um, how we structured the firm. Um, we, we knew we wanted to be a partnership. We knew we uh, valued collaboration and, and, and joint decision-making. Um, and you know, people will ask me often uh, you know, what are the most influential courses I took at, uh, at law school at, in terms of my career. Um, and I always start with the tax story because I never would have done it if I hadn't uh, loved tax. Um, but uh, you know, one of the surprise um, uh, 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 answers I give is con law. Um, the thinking about how we structure the governance of our firm 
Um, it's, of course, we're not structuring a country and we don't have a constitution. But a lot of those principles we think about in, in how we've structured the firm. Um, I, you know, I think about uh, my job has, um, I was an investor almost exclusively in 2003. There were only eight people. I'm now much more of a leader than I am an investor. Um, and being a leader, a lot of it's about um, establishing a culture and promoting a culture. Um, and a lot about uh, culture, I think, is common law. Um, it's, it's understanding the, the context, um, making a decision for the context, uh, enunciating a principle that led you to make that decision, but then recognizing that the next context might not be exactly the same as the last context, so extending the principle but to a different set of facts. Um, and then doing that um, without, without appearing to be or without being arbitrary and capricious. Um, if you want 300 people to follow you, um, they need to know your reasons for making decisions. And so I spend a lot of time giving my reasons for making decisions, whether that's a reason about why somebody got promoted to partner or didn't, uh, or it's a reason about why somebody got paid uh, more or less, uh, or it's a reason about a business that we invested in or a business that we divested in. People want to know that, um, uh, that the, the leaders are not acting in a way that is arbitrary and capricious, and that's about giving good reasons that, um, that extend over time. Um, and then the, the, the final um, thing I'd say is a lot of about, at least my job being a leader, is about imagining the future um, and envisioning the future. And I think that the, when I think about um, the traits that I have now um, that help me a lot there, uh, one of them is seeing patterns um, and using analogies. Um, and that's a lot what we do in legal reasoning. Um, and, uh, and so I think that that, um, that, that, that skill, uh, that ability to, to see analogies um, and, and to see patterns um, and to relate uh, one set of facts to another set of facts has been one of the things that's, that's helped me to develop a vision for the firm. So um, for me, um, for... Uh, all those reasons, uh, I just I wouldn't have achieved what I did without the law school. Thank you very much. Okay.